Hanna is, uh, is an assistant professor at University of Kentucky. And there she works on particularly soil nutrient management uh, in agricultural systems, soil plant systems, and uses this understanding to uh, develop sustainable soil man management practices and resilient uh, production systems. And specifically, her areas of interest include nutrient capture and release by cover crops, spatial temporal controls on nitrogen dynamics, and looking at optimal fertilization practices and root impacts on soil organic matter formation and, and persistence. Um, Hannah got her PhD at Iowa State University in 2017. So Hannah, please uh, take it away for us. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm going to now kind of transition into talking more about um, dynamics of soil organic carbon and greenhouse gas emissions, focusing on the environmental and management drivers. Um, so just a little context um, in terms of what topics we're going to cover in this particular portion of the short course. Um, this is the, just showing kind of a breakdown of the global greenhouse gas emissions. And then you can see here 34% um, coming from food, uh, food systems. And then um, within that, we have about 32% coming from land use and then 39% coming from production. And then within those categories, we're specifically going to talk about soil carbon dynamics and cultivated soils, and then um, nitrous oxide associated with fertilizer use and methane production from rice. Should I use this microphone? Okay. All right, so um, just kind of keeping in mind that soil organic carbon um, makes up a pretty small percentage of uh, the soil by mass. Um, usually less than 5% of the soil mass, but has a big impact on soil properties, which you can see um, in these photos here, um, with the figure on the left showing more um, darker color, looser, um, kind of less compaction to it. Um, we have higher nutrient content, water retention, more biological activity, better ability to retain um, nutrients and even higher crop yields in some cases. Um, I'm going to be, and I'll just mention, I'm going to be talking kind of interchangeably about soil carbon and organic matter, um, keeping in mind that organic matter is composed about 58% of it um, is soil carbon. Um, so soil organic matter we can think of as a portion of uh, soil materials derived from living organisms and most of that is coming from plant litter or crop residue. Um, and so you can see just this example, the cornfield adding a lot of residue to the soil, but only a portion of that is going to actually enter the soil as organic matter. Um, a lot of that carbon is going to be lost as CO2 before it really becomes soil organic matter. And then within soil organic matter, we think a lot about two key fractions. Um, the particulate organic matter that is um, basically fragmented plant tissue that may be encrusted with um, soil minerals but still maintains some um, like visible um, similarity to that original tissue or the original litter that it came from. Um, we can think of it as fragmented plant tissue. And then the mineral associated organic matter that may be single molecules or microscopic fragments associated with uh, the smallest uh, soil particles, the clay and silt particles. Um, and that mineral associated organic matter is usually um, processed by the microbes. So it may be made up of basically dead microbes or microbial products, or it could be uh, soluble forms of organic matter that have um, adsorbed to the minerals. So as we move from um, the left to right here, we're decreasing in size, increasing in density, and increasing in persistence of the organic matter. Um, so molecularly, soil organic matter consists of both plant and microbially derived compounds. So this is just kind of a, an average using um, the neon sites across North America, just showing um, in general, they're, they're made up of biomolecules that we 
um, are coming from plant litter or from the microbes. Um, we do have some contribution of char, which is the product of um, burn, burning of biomass under low oxygen. And then just some more microscope images showing how that particulate organic matter can over time become um, kind of a central part of aggregates as the minerals um, kind of form a crust around the particulate organic matter, the fungi and extracellular polymeric substances kind of glue the organic matter and particles of minerals together. So soil organic carbon represents uh, the stock in a given field will represent the balance of inputs and outputs. As I mentioned, a lot of it is coming from plant litter, but also animal waste, imported bioproducts like compost, um, rhizodeposition, root residues. And then the outputs are primarily um, that microbial respiration, releasing CO2, but it could also be removal through harvested um, you know, grain harvest, for example, um, erosion, and then dissolved organic carbon leaching. And in our cropping systems, um, the subject we're focusing mainly on for this talk, um, we think uh, the major outputs there are the oxidation of carbon and the removal of carbon. Um, so thinking about that balance, uh, we were able to sequester carbon or increase the soil organic carbon stocks by shifting the balance of inputs and outputs so that for a period of time the inputs exceed the outputs. Um, but it does have a limited duration because as the um, soil organic carbon stocks increase, um, then gradually the rate of carbon outputs will increase to match the rate of inputs. So you have a new steady state achieved. And that's a thought to provide you know, t around 20 to 50 years of carbon sequestration before a new steady state level will start to be reached. Um, but it is possible then to implement a new management practice and, and create a new um, carbon sequestration event, I guess, um, by, again, shifting that balance between inputs and outputs. But um, it is possible at some point that you reach a saturation level, which is where additional inputs no longer lead to a further increase in soil carbon. Um, however, generally, we think about our agricultural soils as not really being close to carbon saturation. Um, since we do know historically they've stored a lot more carbon than they do today. So factors that affect carbon inputs and outputs um, in our agricultural systems include um, the species of crops in the rotation, crop productivity, which, which is impacted in turn by interactions of genotype, environment, and management, the fraction of the crop that is harvested, the intensity, so how many crops are produced on average per year, and uh, use of biomaterials such as compost. And then on the output side, um, that can be impacted by temperature, soil aeration status, soil texture, um, disturbance, um, quality of inputs, placement of inputs, and then the use of pyrolysis. Um, so there I'm speaking about biochar, which we'll cover in a little more detail. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but I'm just going to hit a few of these um, to, make, to make some points about opportunities for management. So crop species um, uh, provide different amounts of carbon to the soil. Um, so for example, the MZ is corn. Um, that is, is a crop that generally adds a lot of carbon to the soil. On the other hand, soybeans, um, SB, there um, has a lot less. We're talking probably half, half of what the corn is providing in terms of above ground residue and root carbon inputs. Um, wheat, the one listed there in W, um, is around similar or a little lower than soybean. And then rice is a bit higher, kind of intermediate between uh, maize and wheat. So depending on which crops are used in the rotation, we can have different amounts of carbon being returned to the soil, and that will factor into um, that balance between inputs and outputs. 
We also have um, a lot of different agronomic practices that affect crop productivity, which in turn affects soil organic carbon. Um, so one example is fertilization. Um, so if we add fertilizer, we get higher biomass production. We get um, usually higher soil carbon, um, or we get a, an increase in soil carbon, um, which we can see here on the left um, in a continuous maze system, how increasing the nitrogen fertilizer rate will lead to a more positive soil carbon change for that field, um, which is a much more pronounced effect than what we see with soybean in the rotation since soybean is not responsive to nitrogen fertilizer. Um, so this is just an example of how agronomic management practices can also influence um, the carbon inputs to the soil. And then cropping system intensification. So especially in drier regions um, where fallow is used to, to conserve or uh, build up uh, soil moisture, increasing the intensity of the cropping system can really increase the soil carbon, again, by adding more uh, carbon into the soil through the uh, plant production. So in the left side, this is a study in Colorado across many different farms. Um, you can see here how uh, the wheat, one wheat crop every two years, kind of the standard um, rotation, um, results in the lowest soil carbon and then decreasing the frequency of the fallow, increasing the, the number of crops um, grown on average per year is going to lead to more carbon inputs and more carbon stocks as well. On the side of the organic um, matter outputs, um, this is a kind of a conceptual framework for some of these different mechanisms that provide organic matter protection. Um, so this is a recent review by Catrufo and Lavely. Um, but it, it just kind of categorizes some of these different controls. Um, so we can think about those that cause microbial inhibition. So where temperature is just too low, oxygen is too low for microbes to really decompose. Um, we can have a lot of buildup of organic matter, particularly as particulate organic matter, um, since the microbes aren't really capable of decomposing that under those conditions. However, um, that mechanism is kind of vulnerable because um, when the, if the environmental conditions change, temperature goes up or um, the soil becomes oxygenated, that organic matter can then immediately be decomposed. We also have microbial limitation, which would be more um, not a full inhibition, but just a reduction in the rate of decomposition caused by inadequate energy for the microbes um, to build enzymes to decompose organic matter, um, nutrient limitation or um, moisture limitations. And then on the opposite side, we have the microbial access constraints, which is the mineral associated organic matter, for example, um, creating very fine pore spaces that the microbes cannot uh, get into to access and decompose that organic matter. It could be um, bridging between clay and organic matter provided by calcium, um, organometal complexes with aluminum or iron. Um, so these are all um, mechanisms where the microbes cannot access the organic matter, and, and it's usually in environments with, um, with um, well, I guess you could say this is a situation where you would have more mineral-associated organic matter, and um, it's typically going to be a case where the microbes can break it down to a certain extent, but um, then it becomes less accessible uh, through that association with the minerals. In terms of like thinking about the environmental controls on um, organic matter stocks, I, I think it's instructive just to look at a map of the distribution of soil organic carbon. Um, so you can see how, for example, in the northern latitudes, we have a lot of soil carbon as shown by those darker colors. 
And that's telling us that the low mean temperatures slow decomposition more so than they slow um, the productivity. And so we have a lot of buildup of organic matter in those environments. We also see higher organic matter stocks in more humid environments where um, the, the high rainfall increases uh, plant growth more so than it increases decomposition. Um, so we know that both temperature and moisture affect plant growth and microbial activity, but we can see kind of the net effect of those two by looking at a map <laughs> like this. Um, and then I mentioned drainage as, um, as a control because um, the microbes are, are not going to decompose organic matter as quickly in the absence of oxygen. And we, we can affect uh, the soil aeration status through management and one way is um, through artificial drainage. And this is um, a big um, influence on our carbon stocks. Approximately 25% of U.S. arable land employs some form of drainage, surface or subsurface. And um, so this is just showing um, a comparison of drained versus undrained soilscapes in Iowa. So we're looking, um, the clarion is going to be the summit position. That's the soil profile at the summit. And then going downhill, the Okoboji is actually classified as a wetland. Um, it's be found in a depressional area. But in general, we see, with the exception of the clarion soil, we see that reduction due to drainage. Across, um, across these soils, it was a 5% loss of soil carbon in that top uh, soil, but um, other studies have shown even higher rates of soil carbon loss as well. So this is one thing that um, we can manage um, through drainage, and, and that impacts the carbon based on how quickly that organic matter is decomposed with higher oxygen. Um, and then we have the, the texture. Um, so uh, typically soils with a higher silt and clay content uh, because those minerals help to provide protection against decomposition, those soils generally have higher soil organic carbon. But we also have organomineral interactions, um, not just uh, particle to particle, um, like you kind of see in that top figure, but um, there's also at the larger scale aggregates that can form and occlude um, particulate organic matter within those aggregates, which is a, a, another mechanism of protection. Um, the larger the aggregates, uh, the less stable they become, and the less protection that they provide. Um, but especially the scale of um, kind of a micro aggregate scale, we can provide, um, they can provide some protection to particulate organic matter. And so another uh, management control will be no-till um, because with the less disturbance, um, typically the, um, the aggregates aren't disturbed, they're not broken up, we have better aggregate stability. Um, however, that's really mostly observed near the soil surface. Um, and this uh, diagram from the textbook kind of exemplifies how um, the no-till depth distribution is much more stratified than um, a tilled system. So we see, you know, just looking at the top 20 centimeters uh, a big advantage of no-till in terms of soil carbon, um, but as you go deeper, that effect can even reverse uh, because tillage is kind of burying carbon deeper in the profile. And so um, the increased soil carbon levels are typically most pronounced at the surface. When you look at the whole profile, there may not necessarily be an increase um, in certain environments due to no-till. Um, and then this one, um, litter quality. So um, this one um, is kind of based on the, this understanding that our most stable forms of organic matter, the mineral associated organic matter, is made up in large part by the microbial necromass. And that if you're giving the microbes um, litter that is more decomposable, um, they will produce more biomass, which becomes necromass 
which becomes that mineral associated organic matter. Um, there haven't been a whole lot of study, field studies that have really um, demonstrated this. I think this is kind of something we're just starting to look at in the field research. But I did find this one, which I thought um, made, this, made this connection very well, that um, was using different winter cover crops that differed in their quality, so um, brassica, legume, grass, or a mix. The legume is the most decomposable, um, going to uh, break down the, the fastest, typically. Um, so in this study, you can see the legume um, treatment in like light red there. Uh, produced as much mineral-associated organic matter as the mixture treatment and higher than all the other treatments. Um, despite the fact that the legume actually produced one of the lowest levels of biomass among those treatments. Um, so it just kind of emphasizes that that legume um, with its high litter quality may be more efficient at building soil organic matter and that mineral-associated fraction. Um, this study also showed how that um, legume treatment led to more bacterial necromass than the other cover crop treatments. So kind of links to that understanding that that higher quality building the microbial necromass that becomes the mineral associated organic matter. All right. Um, deep placement is another potential management control operating more on the side of carbon outputs, because we know that in general, um, the deeper you go in the soil, you find a longer residence time of that carbon. Um, it's decomposing more slowly uh, for a number of possible reasons. Less disturbance, the physical inaccessibility due to the very sporadic nature of carbon in the subsoil, the high abundance of mineral surfaces, and the low, uh, the generally unfavorable conditions for microbial activity. Um, when it comes to being able to manage um, uh, carbon placement into the subsoil, um, there hasn't been as much work to really quantify what is the, um, what is the effect uh, these treatments could have. Um, so this recent review looked at a few different management approaches. You can see the N the values for N on this are quite low, so there haven't been a lot of studies on a lot of these. Um, but in general, you know, the effect size is not very big. We're seeing not too much of, a, of an effect, um, even in those subsoil layers um, for things like deep rooting, clay burial, deep plowing. The one that really stands out is organic matter burial, but that's a case where organic matter was brought in from an external location and buried there. So that tends to really um, increase the soil carbon. But it wasn't <clears throat> carbon that was fixed in that particular field. All right, and then um, in terms of final kind of a management control on the carbon output side of the balance is biochar. Um, so this is a <clears throat> material that's produced through thermal treatment of organic matter under low or zero oxygen conditions. And so this produced a very recalcitrant um, material that um, mineralizes much slowly, 10 to 100 times more slowly than uncharred residue. Um, so the other nice thing about biochar is that it, it may have some kind of um, positive feedbacks where adding biochar could help to provide better protection from other, for other organic matter in the soil. Um, and improve the physical properties of the soil to enhance carbon inputs from the crop productivity. I wanted to, before switching over to talking about nitrous oxide, I wanted to mention um, we do have some ancillary effects with different practices that increase soil organic matter in a particular field that we need to pay attention to when we're trying to draw down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So I mentioned like the fertilization as a way to build carbon um, in the soil, but we have to consider the fact that um, there is CO2 generated from fertilizer manufacture um, and, and nitrous oxide associated with that. Um, things like um, a newer application, you know, that's kind of a redistribution of carbon. And so whether um, that's really a net 
benefit is going to depend on what's the alternate fate of that manure. Perennial vegetation is another one that can be very effective at building um, soil carbon in a given field. However, if it's replacing annual crops that may be more productive in terms of food, then it could lead to a leakage effect um, requiring land um, use change in other locations. All right, so I also wanted to touch a little bit of, on nitrous oxide emissions, um, and this can be very important. Um, this is a quote that I pulled from a recent paper out of Iowa, um, just making this point that although there is a lot of focus on soil carbon sequestration, um, especially in our wet corn belt soils, um, we may actually need to be putting greater emphasis on um, managing nitrous oxide emissions because they may provide greater leverage in achieving climate sustainability. So this is a very simplified version of um, what's happening with nitrous oxide. Um, there's many different processes in the soil that cre can create nitrous oxide, um, but the two major ones are nitrification and denitrification. So when we add fertilizer, um, it's usually either ammonium or, or ammonium and nitrate. Um, that ammonium typically is nitrified as long as the conditions are suitable. And in that process of getting converted to nitrate, there is some loss of nitrous oxide. And then that nitrate um, is subject to denitrification, which is another uh, process that's a reducing process that can release nitrous oxide as well as uh, dinitrogen gas. Um, so just kind of the environmental um, factors contributing to nitrification, it's going to be impacted by the supply of the ammonium, just having that nitrifier population, which is usually present in ag soils, um, a good oxygen supply, um, pH close to, well, between 5 and 9, um, adequate soil moisture. So this is optimum near field capacity or a few days after a rainfall event. And then um, optimum at kind of your 25 to 35 degree C range. For denitrification, that's a whole set of different set of conditions. Um, but, you know, for denitrification to happen, you have to have nitrate there. So they, um, you know, this, this can happen in environments with kind of um, shifting um, aerobic conditions. So, Denitrification is a reducing process that is only going to happen under low oxygen levels, um, which could be influenced by soil moisture, texture, compaction, and biological activity since the microbes um, use up oxygen when they're breaking down organic matter. <clears throat> These organisms are um, heterotrophs, they're using organic matter as their energy source. Um, they need a source of nitrate as the alternative electron acceptor, and then they need those optimum temperature conditions. So um, the kind of the optimum water-filled pore space for N2O is thought to be a kind of between 60 and 80 percent water-filled pore space where you get um, the most N2O produced, and it's coming primarily from denitrification. So there's a lot of different interactions of different uh, properties that can affect rates of N2O. In this figure, we're just looking at um, combinations of different variables with the light yellow representing our high fluxes. This is from a study in Iowa, so kind of naturally um, less, less well-drained soils and high organic matter. So I'll just point out a couple. We tend to find higher rates of N2O where there's higher rates of CO2 being also emitted because it is um, kind of following general rates of microbial activity and also high levels of inorganic nitrogen. You can see here um, typically higher rates of N2O with the, the higher volumetric water content. <clears throat> this one was interesting. Um, they actually found really high rates of N2O kind of at low soil temperatures, um, which reflect that spring thaw event where a lot of um, 
carbon is available as those microbes are, are starting to become active and you get pretty high rates of N2O production um, during that thaw period. Um, I guess I'll mention quickly that there's a lot of spatial and temporal variation in N2O emissions. Um, and we'll probably cover this in potentially more with talking about measurement um, ways to measure greenhouse gases. But we see um, pretty sporadic um, fluxes, which, which tend to occur right after fertilizer applications when you do have that adequate um, water-filled pore space and carbon present in the soil as well. All right. And this is just showing how that spatial variation can also be quite high um, with hot spots just in areas of the field that are higher in inorganic N or dissolved organic carbon. Even if the field is uniformly managed, you can have these hot spots. But um, the key thing with nitrous oxide is that it's really um, related closely to how much nitrogen fertilizer is added to the soil. Um, so where you have excess amounts of fertilizer or a nitrogen surplus there um, is really where you get those really uh, rapid increases in N2O emissions. So when it comes to nitrous oxide management strategies, a lot of this relates to fertilizer management. Um, what's the rate? If you're going higher or lower than recommended, that's really going to impact the N2O. But also um, nitrification inhibitors which slow down that, the two processes that create N2O can be very effective as well. And then some of the, the practices that can impact soil carbon stocks um, may have um, kind of, from this uh, meta-analysis, kind of neutral effects, but um, they can be kind of variable depending on the study that you look at. <laughs> Last thing I wanted to mention about N2O is that um, we had to consider indirect as well as direct uh, emissions of N2O. Um, so even though um, you know, nitrate can also leach from the soil, that may not be measured in the, the field itself, but that nitrate that's leached um, can then be lost as N2O elsewhere in the landscape. Um, and then the ammonia that's volatilized from soils after fertilizer application can be deposited and transformed um, losses into O elsewhere. All right, the last um, quick um, topic is the methane production from rice paddies. Um, so this methane production in terms of cropping systems really only an issue in rice paddies uh, because this is a process that um, is done by very strict anaerobes only in the absence of all other more favorable electron acceptors. Um, so we really only get these conditions in flooded rice paddies. Um, the rice plants themselves, they're not shown in this diagram, but um, they kind of play a role in transferring the methane to the atmosphere um, because they act as a conduit of those gases. Um, there are methanotrophs that live near the soil surface that can oxidize the methane, but if those are kind of bypassed um, by the gases going through the plant, you know, it's going directly to the atmosphere. Um, so a recent review looked at some different management practices to reduce methane from rice production. And a lot of it seems to come down to how the water is managed, as you might suspect. Um, so um, you know, going to alternate wetting, wet, dry type of a flooding system rather than continuous flooding um, or just to dry upland rice production is going to dramatically decrease the, the methane emissions. But also how the organic amendments are managed. So instead of incorporating organic matter just before planting, uh, it can be incorporated in the off season the use of biochar can also really decrease the methane emissions. <coughs> so I had to include something from Keith in my presentation, but I really like this because I think it puts it all together that um, we talked about a lot of different environmental and management controls, 
um, the one that is best for a given um, farm or field, it's really going to depend on the environmental context and management history. Um, so depending on what the baseline condition is, the appropriate mitigation practice is probably going to differ. Um, so I won't go through the whole decision tree, but kind of that's the, the main point is there's no one size fits all um, best management practice for climate smart agriculture. And with that, um, I'll, I think we have probably time for questions, but feel free to also reach out to me as well so, by email.